indeed uh, proud this year to be able to honor William E. Poet and Printer as our 1991 recipient. Bill Everson has lived in Santa Cruz County for many years. He's general, generously shared his artistic talents with literally thousands of Santa Cruz County citizens. And his well-deserved national reputation has uh, enabled Santa Cruz County uh, to be known far and wide, as we all who live here know it, as a wonderful place for talented and uh, abundant artists to live in. Tonight we're going to honor Bill Everson. Uh, we are going to have two colleagues profile aspects of his life and work. And finally, we're going to be honored by hearing him read to us from his works. So we'll begin with the honors. I'd like first to uh, welcome Marilyn Hansen, who's representing, representing Senator Henry Mello. Marilyn? Mm. Uh, Senator Mello couldn't be here tonight. He's on call for budget hearings in Sacramento, which you know is all very important to all of us. And so he asked me to be here to present a resolution to uh, William Everson. It's my great pleasure to do this. The resolution summarizes in very few words a life of a man of many, many words, a master poet and hand printer of great distinction. Thank you. Next in line is Sally Johnson, representing Assembly Member Sam Farr. Sally. Assemblyman Sam Farr also couldn't be here, but he wanted very much to commend William Everson on his ability not only to create words and inspire us that way, but to imbue our community through the students he's taught with an aesthetic that was all his own. Thank you very much. And I'd like you to welcome Gary Patton, County Supervisor of Bill Everson's District. In words that we can all read in one of William Everson's hand-printed poems, which is in the case right opposite the elevator on this floor in the county center. He said this about two redwood trees located in Kingfisher Flat in Davenport in the land where he lives. The felt, they felt the demon of fire lick its running tongue up their shaggy skin and not flinched, scorched, but unscarred in the long warfare, the stress, tension, shaping fuel to fire, the life flux of their kind. It seems to me, as we celebrate the artists of the year, we celebrate the purpose of art for all of us, which is to help us in our lives indeed, like the Redwoods, to shape our fuel to the fires which we confront so we can burn bright, and we do so like the redwoods by sending our roots deep so that we can strain upwards always to the high embrace, which is the name of that poem. I am delighted to honor William Everson, whose roots go so deep and whose embrace goes so high. I have, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, a proclamation honoring William Everson as the 1991 Artist of the Year in Santa Cruz County. I'm really, 
I'm hardly a representative of um, our Congressman Leon Panetta, but I do have a letter from Congressman Panetta congratulating Bill Everson. And finally, I'd just like to show you the perpetual plaque to which Bill Everson's name has been added, which is on permanent display here in the county building, listing all our artists of the year. Bill, you don't have to take this away. We'll keep this one. <laughs> Next, uh, we'll have our profiles, Mr. Everson. And first, I'd like to introduce uh, Gary Young, a fine printer in Santa Cruz County, and also a connoisseur of poetry. Gary? Twenty years ago, I was an undergraduate at the University of California here in Santa Cruz. I was going to be a poet, and I was on fire with the idea of it. So you can imagine my excitement when I learned that William Everson was going to come on our campus and teach. I thought, here's finally someone who will be speaking my language. I remember the first time I sat in on his birth of a poet class, I was shocked to discover that he was speaking a language that I didn't know. And in these 20 years since I listened to him speak then, I feel that I'm just now learning the art of translation. I know that I'm not alone. There were many of us who never accepted credit for that class. I, I worry now that maybe this was affecting your, uh, your salary at the time, Bill. I hope that wasn't the case. <laughs> but I felt very strongly I did not want to contaminate what was happening in this class with the protocols of class cards and all the rigmarole that the university asked of us. I wanted to listen to Bill speak on my own. Because what he was talking about was so profound and so moving that it paled the rest of my university experience. And I felt that getting credit for listening to Bill Lecture would have been like getting credit for watching the clouds. I went away for graduate school, and while I was gone, Bill started printing and opened the Lime Kiln Press and his vast knowledge of the black art to students. I was never a printer under Bill, but I have, uh, I count, many of my dearest friends were students of Bill, so I feel that I've gotten the reflection of that, as have many. Bill's father was a printer, he grew up in a print shop, went back to printing at the conscientious objectors camp during World War II, and from the very beginning, turned out masterpieces. There's no other word for it. And I think it's fair to say that not since Blake have we had uh, the perfect marriage of poet and printer that we have in Bill. We are very fortunate to have an opportunity not only to hear him read tonight, but to observe uh, his printing. Someone is spiritual and as sensual as Bill, it seems natural that he would become a printer. There is really nothing quite as voluptuous as holding a type stick in your hand that's heavy with a poem. And Bill has shared that with a whole generation, actually two generations, starting during the war and then again at the University of California. His books, I think particularly of, of uh, the privacy of speech and of his Psalter, which is generally conceded to be one of the most beautiful pieces of printed art of this century or any other century. And at Santa Cruz, he led the students there uh, in the creation of masterpieces, American Bard, and in uh, Cypress and Granite. Five years ago, the Printer's Chapel, a group of printers which I am a member, 
most of whom were students of Bill's, had a show here which traveled to Chicago and to New York. And Bill was kind enough to write an introduction. I would like to quote a piece of this foreword. When I came to Santa Cruz in the early 70s, I was aware of the quickening body of writers sprung up almost overnight around the university, and I was happy to join it. But that was not the reason I came. I came because an ancient hand press stood unused in the foyer of the university library and cried out for consummation in a noble text. The articulation of the word, the physical articulation of the word, has been the root of uh, Bill's profound influence here. And I can only uh, join the many others in thanking him for that. And the next profile will be given by Jim Houston. Jim, if I may have just a moment, I'd like to recognize uh, you as a previous recipient of our Artist of the Year Award. Please uh, give a hand to Mr. Houston. And, and we have several other previous award winners here who, would, are, who are here tonight to honor Bill Everson. Just a moment. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where they're all sitting. I'll point out the ones I do. Uh, first of all, Lou Harrison. <laughs> Chuck Hilger in the back by the door. The Cabrillo Guild of Music is represented by Tom Fredericks and Ellen Premack. I don't know where they are. In the hall, back in the hall. And uh, the Cultural Council of Santa Cruz County is represented by Lynn Magruder. She's in the back corner there. And, and finally, Tandy Beal said, Gretz, she's out of town and can't be here tonight. So, now Jim Houston. Sorry, no problem. Jimmy and the help needs to go up there. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Bill Everson has distinguished himself in so many admirable ways that it's, it's really hard to know where to begin talking about his life and his work. Uh, as we all know, he's a poet of international renown, uh, widely read and widely awarded. Uh, as Gary Young just described for you, he's a, he's a world-class printer who's, who's inspired a whole generation of younger printers to carry on the flame of his, of his, uh, of his heritage. He's a scholar and he's a literary historian. Uh, our foremost expert on the life and the work of Robinson Jeffers. And like Jeffers, he has been a celebrator of landscape and seascape. And thus he speaks with a p particular resonance uh, to those of us who are here on the West Coast, because this is his region. In the hillsides of the Long Coast Range, and in the valleys, and on the beaches, and in the beaks, and the cries of the shorebirds, uh, he's found some of his richest imagery. What I am most compelled to pay tribute to uh, in the few minutes I'm going to take here uh, is the enormous spiritual achievement of this man, uh, since I believe that is the source of all that has followed. Uh, I first met him, as Gary Young did, about, about 20 years ago, soon after he came down here to take a position as poet in residence uh, at the then uh, recently established Kresge College at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I soon realized as I know a number of you here tonight also have realized <clears throat> that I had met a spiritual father. This recognition had in, to do in part with Bill's charismatic presence and personal power. Uh, it also had to do with the fact that he is, as I am, a native Californian with strongly felt roots in his home region. Uh, perhaps his great patriarchal beard had uh, something to do with his effect on me, uh, but more profoundly, uh, as I came to know him, I saw that here was a man of conscience uh, who set a very high example. And here was a writer uh, who had done something that is, uh, if I can use one of his favorite terms, uh, archetypal. 
he had found a way to join the life of language and the life of the spirit as a vocation and as a calling. Uh, and this spoke to me in a very deep way. Why did it speak to me? Uh, well, as it happens, uh, I, I grew up in a, in a devout and church-going family. I won't say which church. The important thing is that all our religious activities consisted of words, prayer, scripture reading, exhortations, sermons and songs. Our communications with God were made of words. And I know this had a subliminal and lasting effect. Even though I left that particular organization behind, by the time I was 18, the role that language could play stayed with me. The idea that words can somehow move you along a path toward salvation, that words have an integral part to play in this process. The Gospel according to St. John begins with a sentence that spells it out for us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. More than any other writer I have known, William Everson has gone the distance with the implications of this sentence, pursuing the connection between language and the sacred, and, uh, and our participation in that as writers and or as supplicants, as seekers. Uh, a lot of literary work, in a lot of work, you will find an, an implicit sacred dimension. Uh, Bill e Everson has been marvelously explicit, making his own quest his major subject, giving voice to his own dialogue with God, as he has explored the hazards of holiness in the mid-20th century, the struggles of the flesh, and ultimately the sanctity of the flesh, as well as the sanctity and the violent mystery of our Western landscape. He has given us an abundant and luminous body of work that is, I don't want to use the term religious here because that always sounds to me too institutional, but a body of work that charts his own singular spiritual journey, a journey carried out in the heart and also on the page. Before he moved to this county, he had spent 18 years in the, in the Dominican order, during which time he became famous as Brother Antoninus and distinguished himself as one of the foremost Catholic writers of our era. He left the order in 1969. He settled in Swanton, Davenport in 1971. And since that time, he has become famous again, or in another way, uh, as William Everson. It has been an amazingly productive period by anyone's measure. Since he's been here, he has received a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. He received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the National Poetry Association, a Body of Work Award from the Penn Center USA, his monumental tribute to the poetry of Robinson Jeffers, granted in Cyprus, which is on display right outside here in the corridor, was named one of the 70 best printed books in American history, that is, in the history of American printing. In addition, during the past 20 years, he has published 18 titles, or 20 or 21, I can't keep track of them all. Um, the, the Masks of Drought, from which he's going to read tonight, uh, Archetype West, his landmark study of the West as a literary region, The Veritable Years, which won the Shelley Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America, and he continues to write. He is currently in the midst of a long family chronicle in verse entitled The Engendering Flood, the first volume of which just came out last year. It's really an inspiring combination of creative energy and spiritual vision that has enriched all of our lives. And tonight we have a chance to let him know how deeply we have treasured his presence in our midst for these past two decades. It is my great pleasure and privilege to introduce to you the 1991 Santa Cruz County Artist of the Year and one of the great American poets of the 20th century, William Everson.
Better luck next time. <laughs> Laughing. This isn't stage right. Yeah. That's my little wife. She gave us the opening of the last, last the job, almost all starting series. And the first poem I wrote in that occurred. Too much of a hammer. <laughs> I feel as if I'm stumbled into a, the mother of all the word ceremonies. I said, a prophet is not without honor in his own country. And he ought to know. The eloquence of the prophet. There's no equal except in his own own town. The charismatic man is too so close to his roots that he seems invisible to his own period and his own time. Life goes on around him. He absorbs it all. Sleeps on it, dreams on it. And then speak. I want to thank you for making this possible. Storm surge. Christmas Eve, night of night, and Big Creek is on the move. At the equinox, tempting rains toyed with us, teasing. And offshore at sea, Christmas Eve, night of night, and Big Creek is on the move. 
I see you can ask. Tempting rains toyed with us, teasing and offshore at sea. The unsigned sandbar blocking the river mouth. The great gray salmon skulked in the trough, dreaming no long genetic dream, asthmatic slumber of the unfulfilled, awaiting the moment of the fourth star. The river tongue in the seas of all the, the strength in the swamp. First incremental showers, frosted head vegetation, cathartic, purging the veins of the cleft mountain. Then a month of drought reimposed itself. The fervid summer's condign sterility, drying the glaze, sucking the flow back into the hill, as if the mountain begrudged what it gave, call back its gifts, summoning them home, and high largesse repentant of its grace. Advent broke dry, December harsh on the hill, no sign of cloud on the steely horizon. But solstice brought a respite. A northwest flurry shook the last limbs bare. The drum of hailstones rattling the spindles under the little, little cloud. Then the wind swung south and the nimbus struck. One thousand mile storm enveloping the coast. Forty-eight hours of bitter vertical rain, water falling like the splurge of God, the squandering of heaven, as if forever on the mountains and the dawns, as if forever on the river forks and creeks, as if forever on the vast watersheds, its sheer declivities, its seaward pitching slides, first shrunken slopes of the parched ridges, and lean in the dark, the harsh pulsation of night, big creek gorged in torrent, Hearing his logs hit one another, shoot that flood, batter their way to the sandbar on the sea, ripping a cha channel out of it, out to the future, the space beyond time, on the eve of the coming, when Christ, the principle and the purpose, splits the womb in his shudder of birth. The rush of wings, the sound of sheer knife thrust, or the hatchet stroke of the thrown blade. Then the sharp slap, high up, the hurtling shape, hitting thick branches. Off with it. The great goshawk, knocked out of the sky, awkwardly peers, clutching at, clutching at twigs. But a canyon red veils, his fierce tormentors close in on him, snarling like cat. The stunned intruder takes off, uncertainly gliding. His pursuers, like vengeful priests, follow him out. Abruptly, the canyon is quiet. The morning sunlight calmly descends. The clean day scar soars on. One portent. Over the horizon, some dark approacher forecasting his presence, or a movement out there from the larger life, the nation, or the world, or maybe my own dark thought, a sudden impulse, impulsion of spirit, momently intruding, to be hurried forth, unable to challenge that purpose, or something more somberly blooded, some reflex of the life force, in consonant with the whole, and hence obtrusive and unavailable, and you all, one waits to know. But something was meant. In the visionary dream, a movement from beyond the, uh, the cosmic hole was registered here. In the wing flash and the snarling beaks, the counterforce challenged a fixed field. But to no avail. Net and overcome it was swept from consequence, evicted from shuddering out. Four wet winters and now to dry. All the long season, the sterile frost drips the mountain. The coast like flanged metal bent towards the sea. Above, strip trees, top twisted branches, catch dark white light. Below, shriveled creek beds, raw to the air, run naked roots, obscenely growing through flaking rock, a scat of torrents. An early last evening, a thin drizzle, gaining toward dust. Or dark drop in low-hanging clouds. 
with his belly on the rain plunge. All night long the thirsty slopes drank straight falling water, soaking it up, filling those tilted, deep shelving seams, blue veins of the mountain, zigzag crevices of fractured shale. The dawn fled and the rain held the run up the end. He rise with the light, sally down to the streams with touch fresh water for a kind of blessing. We find instead a river of ink. All the horde of tributary tea, creek, those catchers of relief drift, the strip of alder and the slough of fur, acrid shafts of the leathery panel, and laurel, the redolent, mirror and leaves of the laurel. All that autumn spun opulence, frost rose down and ruthlessly squandered four months back to rot where it fell. Now crawls to the sea, a liquid vial. You look up at last in a wondering way and exclaim softly, Why, the mountain is menstruating. Something in your voice, a tremor there, tells of the mutual womanly pulse, the deep sensing, the sympathetic pang, the soft vibration. Looking I see indeed it is true. These like dead cells, long held back in the frigid womb, begin now to flow. Under the rain, a deep cleansing, this right of renewal. For me it is runoff, but my heart purges. Touching you and creeps out in the same impulse, I am healed the frost. Woman and water in the blood flow. Blackbird sundown. High Ridge Ranch. Back of the barn, the live oak thicket. And red-winged blackbirds in the late afternoon. They cluster on the fence posts, twig stems, barbed wire, telephone lines, any proximate perch. And then in the apparatus gleam in the fading light, vivid scarlet on the glistening black. Intensely alive, they frolic and strut, chatter the twanging blackbird tongue, jubilant in the bird's out evening. A sudden hush. In the suspension of sound, silence drops to stunned terror. Then all explodes, every bird for itself, up, down, out, and away. For over the ridge, the shoulders of flight massively outstretched, the hunch body tense with hunger, rapid with need, the great horned owl drives implacably in, wide staring eyes fixed on her prey. Instantly every bird recovers, bringing back to the defense they converge on her, a racket of protest, a squall of implication. Undeterred, she stands the yard, plunges into this oak thicket. Behind her swarm the defenders, the stiletto beaks, the stabbing and yanking, its flurry of snatched feathers, wagging her sides. In a trice she emerges, a half-dead fledgling gripped in each fist, the malignant face swinging right and left as she scans the yard, glaring down her confronters. Again the red wings close on her, railing and scolding, their punishing beaks a fury of reprisal. She shrugs them aside contemptuously and pauses a moment, ugly, umbrageous, triumphant. And then she takes off, her dread profile humped in departure. Infinitely unhurried, she clears the corral, skims the fence, and is gone. And with her going, the dust drops. For a moment before, light, late light glimmered, now darkness swoops on the land. Red wings circle and descend, seeking down Bruce, pulling her shattered world back together. Stepping into the oak thicket, drifting towards sleep. Out in the woods, the three she owls and eight hoots once, hoots twice. The soft tattoo must be the hush. She does not reply. The silence is the answer of the hearkening dead, listening for life, and life is no more. Over the ridge, the darkness shuts like a wing. The earth still tightens. The claw moon talons the west. Gabriel. One time a critic said, this is Everson Xavier. All the young summer, the gray breed prospered. The new brood, fledged early and growing apace, took over the canyon, a stellar triumph. Black, bright, sporting this razor-sharp profile, they probed ever cranny. Whatever accosted must pass inspection, not suffer abuse. Scolding, truculent, cunning, vindictive, 
They started about the canyons and we endured them. Downstream by the meadow, our creekside neighbors shot them with guns and hung the seed bodies in the apple trees to scare off robbers. Here, under the towering canopy of redwoods, we let them live and suffer their gall. And indeed, that very abrasion bespeaks them. After the gloomy tree sodden winter, the jay bird the bureau that fills a definite need. I have, in fact, gone so far in complicity as to scatter crumbs on an old stump to lure them in, swooping, rude, iridescent streaks, angling through the slant shafts of the sun between column redwoods, their raucous bravado of my guiltful delight. But the cats are not amused. <laughs> Talking the yard, they endured that umbrage nastily. They had bombed from behind, they crouched flat eared and bare their fangs. Often they scanned the sky, the trees, the hedging thicket, possessed of a throttle rage, a passion apparently held hopeless given the jay's tree top of unity, but nursed nevertheless. Corrosive desire clenched to the heart against the long deprived accounting, the great day of feline retribution. Meantime, the jays cursed back and streaked in, peering. Then early afternoon, the hour lazy and bland, the strickling jay got down from the trees to pick off a cricket. At ease in the grass, confident of his long legs or quick takeoff, he steered his game with nice precision. Foiled in his beak, the hapless insect wriggled and strove. Intrigued, the jay let it squirm, then flipped it aside, pounced, stabbed twice, artfully toying. But all unnoticed in the wide summer day, the black tom got his wits together. A slink under the hibachi stand, the ain't stealthily forward, tail twitching. Suddenly the jay sensed him. One electric spring of those long legs and he lit out, the cricket still foiling his beak. Too late, too late. Lightning unleashed, the black tom caught him full stretch in the rush and foot off the ground and going away. One terrified squawk and the cricket spinning. And bird and cat hit the grass together in a feathery tussle. The end, the mad scrambling end and the clutch triumph. The butt close of a long life gamble. Not yet, not yet. Pressed under the paws, the jay's head struggled out, screeching piteously. The jay breed responded, converging from thicket and scrub. When the tall stands of redwood and the stream side halted, they closed the end. The long flight angles came down, not jockeying now for scattered crumbs, but swooping for life, the only life they know, the preservable breed. Wheeling above the couch pair, they danced like blue devils. The black tongue grinned up at them. His neck crane, his white teeth gleaming behind his stretched lips. His eyes yellow fire. Under his feet, the cock crane implored, piteously, the long lament, the life story. That horrible blue brought the cat tribe in from the listening woods. First little squeak, least of the litter, who snatched the prey from her brother's paw, distracted by jaybirds. But she too, Donald, she too toyed with that pleading life, that her bigger sister, greedy minx, snatched it away and with one clench of her jaw crushed the black crusted head. Instantly all fell still. The fierce clamor hushed. The yard deeply silent. When twig and branch the jays looked down, stunned, shaken. And then the parent bird gave the shot, tut tut, a dark signal of termination, and they also caught. The cats ignored what they caught, left the feudal remains, small wing flurry of the spent cyclone, scattered in the grass. As for me, something within was held suspended. The extravagant episode suddenly quenched, like a wrench of ether slashed on my heart. I picked up the disheveled, resplendent wings and stretched them to let the light fall through, translucent blue in the wild feathers, and the elegant tail that had put it in death and not one, and the final gesture, the elegant claw, hook hook with the sky. I took the numinous trophies inside the house to dry on a ledge. Well placed, the iridescent message goes in the room. To reveal from behind the screen of nature the life of God. But what was the vibration that trailed through the rooms as they wrote more than in and clings yet to my hands like mountain misery? A speck of blood flecked my fingernail, tasting, I imagined, it salt. But the moment was no more.
outside in the mango day, the black tongs went between the little hibachi stand and took up his coat. The touch of swagger transmitted out of the fetch of the jay, invested his movements with auspicious pomp. Oh, what animal cunning is like the feline lip. Please look clean as a wing bone whistle. Reality reduced to a feather in the grass. A plume in the fern. Whatever death is, the jaybird learned it. But the black toms in her, foiled in this contradiction, on the infinite satisfaction of life. The yellow eyes, blank as the sun, ceaselessly scan the jailless sky, and not blink. I'm reading my way straight into the book. I usually do a lot more talking, but tonight it seems better to read the poem. Steelhead. Incipient summer, scorch of the sun, and the great steelhead shows up in our creek. He lies in a pool, a shallow basin of a thin rock weir, and impassively waiting. Ten days go by and still he lingers. The presence is incredible. Lost the, didn't lose it. That was a mistake. He still he lingers. His presence is incredible. No one around here recalls such a thing. Steelhead man locked in summer. For the tag end of April sees the last of them. Under a, and like all salmon, rising in winter to die at the spawn, steelhead commonly rigged back to sea. Climbing the, the river path year after year, continuing continuous the track, the journey joined, in, indomitable the will, the life thrust. But this, this aberration, what is this meaning and why here? Deeper hideouts above and below, where salmon and steel have alike at the spawn, await their time. Those same deep holes are perfect places to light out the, the drought where such is purpose but on but no dangerously is, uh, exposed in windowpane water he lies alone and waits and, and passively waits dreaming last night I heard stiffly arose drove my way down to the scarred slopes to a shallow pool I knew it for his the moon giveth black light to see by. But sensing him there, I made vaguely out, alone on the bottom like a sunken stick. No, like a godson monk prostrate in his cell, that enigmatic shape, sleeplessly intent. Daunted, I left him alone in that hapless place and crept back to bed. To go down in the dawn, seeking him out as in my dream, holding him there in my mind's eye. Still pointed upstream, smelling the high headwaters, where all, all about him the dance of life sweeps rapturously on. Giddy with delight, the moths fly double, and in a spasm of joy, the mayflies breathe. Above on the bank, our Labrador bitch, massively in heat, hears her elk hound lover yelp on the hill and will not heal. While under the weir, the tangent crayfish. Gnome of these waters ponderously grapples his viscid consort, all fever of slate. Only myself, stooping to fathom this, his meaning here, knows the tightening nerve. What his time portends I dare not guess, but much or little, brief or prolonged, in this recondite presence I am favored in my life, 
honored in my being, illumined in my faith. As heraldic gesture, he sounds the death pang of all abnegation, witness to the world. Segregate, wrenched out of contact, bearing the abs the suppressed restlessness of all disjunction, subsumed in the abstract dimension, this blood life of the out of time, out of season, out of place and out of purpose, ineluctable Gloria, he burns in my dream and calls me from sleep. So I'm hardly surprised to find by the water the scattered remains where the raccoon swung him. Toward gill from thin, devoured the life sustaining flesh, and left in the clay a faint skeletal imprint as fossil, etched in stone, spans time like myth, the glyph of God. Cutting the fire break. Brace yourself for this one. <laughs> Mowing the east field under the ridge, I wave the wind. The bent rib sized down, rusting in the barn, swings in the sun. The ancient blade of my wife's great grandfather, drawn from the dust of seventy years, lies in the grass. They don't make this. They don't make them like this anymore. This old girl cackled the smith. Punched above his spectrum grindstone, shouting across the howl of iron and the flare of spark. He paused, spat on the blade, wiping off rust. In sudden silence, the wedding, ring, the wedding band he wore on his finger chimed fine steel. Cackling his head, cocking his head like a listening bird, he snatched up a file and rapped again. Hear that hum in her spine, that tone when she shivers? He barked harsh laughter. The old timer's got a name for it. Turning, he cut the power, stepped down from the bed. They call it the moan of death. And that hunger vibrates up the crooked stalk as when the grass reels. I feel it hung in my arms, stroke on stroke, rising. It sings in my shoulders. My collarbone rings to the pulse of it, the ravenous steel. And I swing with it, made one with it, wheeling among the standing ferns, goat-footed, tramping tall bracken, ruthless, the radiant flowers, iris, wild orchid, leopard lily, the flush and shimmering splendor of life. And then the honing. That stone and steel kiss each other. They crave it so. They lick their lips greedily together, like reckless lovers, whereas the whore mouths the man. I have to pull them apart. The mad sighs, hisses in the vet, the snake denied, moans in the arrow. <laughs> Oh, the grunt of lovers biting each other, stroke on stroke, coupling through hell. It makes the sex growl in my groin to call them down. Wild iris, lily, the moan and the shudder. All the women in my life sprawled in the weeds, drunk in death. Rattlesnake August. The rainless winter. Week on week, sun edging the hills in the sparse gray grip. Summer broke dry. The tightness of heat quenched the sterile coast, a fierce parching. No fog tended the light. The shred of fire stung the rustling air. At midsummer's moon, leaves littered raw earth. Then late one dusk, our Labrador bit slogged home half lane, bleeding a little under the jaw, but we thought nothing of it likely stuck on the thorn. Morning found her prostrate, the head swollen, hugely swollen, the throat hemorrhaging blood. Snake bite, said the vet, and she's too far gone. Tonight she will die. We stared at each other. Rattlesnakes in Big Creek Canyon? Unheard of. But the vet shook his head. This goddamn drought that forces them down from their mountain dens to creek water. There's known places this year no snakes ever been seen in before, and they're not done yet. Now, with night dropping, we sit in the last late unnatural silence, awaiting the friendly scratch of the door. We know will not come. 
This loss is a wound, tearing the sensitive fabric of our life, and it aches in us. We think of the snake out there in the dark, lurking, the vibration of evil, coiling under the roots of trees, alive beneath stones, listening. I see tears blind your eyes. Tonight I know you will tear my snake totem down from the wall and burn it bitterly, your lips moving, your eyes blue eyes. I do not begrudge it. Your way is the best. For two themes contend here, the loss and the menace, double tang of the twisted heart. We brace for disaster, a vast conflagration, a holocaust born on the eastern path, sweeping down to the sea, burning house sites and bridges, driving, it, driving the coastal population out onto the roads. It is yet to happen. Rather, the subtle insinuation, riding secretly into the warm nest to spit venom. Because sunspots desperately flare on the fountain of fire, must sun something displace, give it man's life, take, the friend, take his friend and companion, whatever he loves must be taken, must go. I leave the table, step out under stars, smelling dryness in the air, and death, the presence of death. Worker in the dark, where are you? Carried by heat, possessed of a taut desperation, the serpentine itch, driven down from some cool, commodious hole higher up, he descends, seeking water, water, raw slate for his thirst. For he too loves life, he too craves comfort, smells it cunningly out, and when Theta coughs, licks his lip and stabs back. Three hours, shimmering graceful presences, swaying below the creek bank, halfway down. It'll make welcome wood come winter. I bring the blade, wiping it, handing it gingerly. Size and axes, I understand, but the chainsaw? What governs it? The mechanistic fury, the annihilate god. I hear him moaning there, drawing the lovely alders down, calling them. I feel the hunger of death pulse in his loins, tremble in his tears. I smell his breath. Settling the squat metallic beast on the ground, I grip the starter, spin once, spin twice. The deafening roar of the engine grabs, coughs, grabs again, then settles into it, a rapacious snore. Holding it forth in tense hands, I approach the tree, putting my way through vine tangle, cautiously stepping. As I move, the lethal snout rolls ahead, snuffing for prey. I place the blade, choosing the woman's smooth bark, the naked skin. A trigger finger crooks and the chain leaps forward, chews white flesh. Sawdust pours up at my feet, birds whistle from the jagged gash like gore, like flowing blood. Cutting in close, I lean on the steel, the blade whining. The tree starts over, then hangs there, hovering on its axis, death in its veins. An ominous rushing of wind overhead and brings a splintering shriek. I scramble aside, watching it topple, with a shattering crash that hits the heaviness fattening in the air. Paul comes across the gigantic lip and twists crazily, but flopping, but flopping skyward. I stand there staring, the hushed star whispering in my hand, asking, asking. Next number two, sheared through with the trunk and it drops without a hitch. They push over it. Confident now, I turn to the third, the shrill saw whine, steel teeth tearing. I bear down on it, forcing it, the blade snarling. At last it goes over. But as it crashes, crashes across, skinning the others, the left whips wide and spins toward me. Startled, I step back, one half step back into nothing. Saving myself, I lunge forward. I bid for balance, but the blade stoops. Suddenly I feel a terrible insinuative plucking at my knees, picking at my flesh. It is the chain, the, the nipping incisor, the chipping teeth. 
just over my leg, the blue thing hovered, floating there, all his passion suspended in check, eager to pounce. Appalled, I heaved the beast up, falling back, the blade roaring. I hurled it aside and go down. It lands on granite, the chain spewing sparks, the engine chattering. Flat on my back, I struggle up and crawl over. I cut the switch. Then I look down. In crystalline terror, I'm, I see the nick of shark, shark teeth etched across my knee. The dreadful angle of the, on the blue denim, the white black thread. Stunned, I pull on up my jeans, looking for blood, the target area. Fall kneecap, naked thigh, not a scrap. A sense of relief delivers me. Then a dizzying faintness, something clutching my throat. Shaken, I get to my feet, leave the beast where it lies and hobble home. Pouring myself a stiff one, I melt it down raw. The slug hits like a fist. In the still afternoon, I hear the shivering glass chip my feet. All evening long, using alone, the family away, the house empty. I sit in my whiskey and feel of it, the rock leg, groping for something no longer there, something gone. All evening long, the long next day, I hobble about on my pitiful stump. Something is finished, something cleanly done. Sprawled on the creek bank, the trees lie untouched. I have no appetite for the saw. I might have died there under those alders and bled to death before help came. But that is not in the mind. What is there is an absence, a simple loss, the lack of a leg. Perfectly sound, I hobble about. Not the ghost of a member swung from my hip, not even my a peg. And I think of the three graves, silent and under hanging moss up Scott Creek Canyon. Three clearly marked graves, all pioneer women, peaceful in the sun. But among them, according to legend, the man's leg is buried. Torn off long ago by a sow grizzly protecting her cub, and solemnly interred in the quaint pioneer fashion. Dust and ashes, the name member reposes, but in my mind's eye it glows in the ground, inseminating the female presences, instinct with seed. Like a siren, like a seeress, the histalis potent in death, or a strong struck obvious, fragmented under the female fury. The swinging flag. And using I let my fingers rope down, feeling, fumbling, for what is no longer there, only the absence, only the emptiness, the blank truncation, the folly of the three elders, the terrible stone. Thank you very much. Bicorn. No.
from Tom Spank, and the closing poem of the book. Yielding Buck shot through the lungs and made it out of the brush and halfway to the stream before he fell. The illegal hunter never followed through. What dropped in the meadow died where it lay, unnoticed by any save two red bulls fenced in that field. The following day a great black bird rose up when we came, lurched clumsily off, the wings made for soaring, baffled now in this hemmed enclosure, this deep forest field. Late that night the coyotes found him. He heard from afar the yelping chorus, clamoration of the feast. I, I sung litany to the winning of time, the brevity of life. And the next morning a great bird was back with a dozen others, the vulturine horn. Ghouls out of hell, they perched on the carcass, angling each other out at the plucking. The riddle at the plucking, obscenely gobbling the riddle of guts. Our abrupt arrival sent them hissing aloft, to circle in the light, teetering and balancing on the tall fir tops, refusing to abrogate their ancient place at the their ancient prerogative, their ancient place, their ancestral place at the sharing of the kill. Two days later the sentinel bull stood over the torn and scattered remains, bellowing, lugubriously lowing, solemnly and lamenting, the passing away of all slotted hooves kind. Mourning the death of their nimbler comrade, the little cousin of the woods. We paused there, disbelieving, and spoke to them as best we could. They stared back, uncomprehending, not to be consoled. Chagrined, we trudged on. The following weeks found left nothing much but a tuned shin bone and a scrap of hide. No birds in the sky, no movement in the woods. Nothing but the sparse pasture, the two and the two red bulls placidly cropping the lank cover and emptiness in the air. Then the changing year brought a leaf flurry. Equinoctial rains replenished the earth. In the body print of the buck, the first green grass thickened the bronze. And we said, the cycle is complete. The episode is over. But the silence that hung about that place was haunted. The presence of something anciently ordained, where we, unwitting acolytes, with the birds and the bulls, the great listening mountain above for witness, the sacrificial host between the river and the woods.